going to just uh, have a bit of a freewheeling chat and we'd love for all of you to participate. Uh, and may maybe we'll start off with a round of introductions. So Shubham, do you want to kick it off? Yeah. Thanks. Am I audible? Oh. Yeah, hi, thanks Kanika. Yeah, so I'm a managing director at Pio Ventures. We are, we are the earliest AI fund. We started in 2017. Uh, now we've uh, expanded our focus area. So we are broadly a deep tech fund with still a heavy emphasis on disruptive AI investments. And I'll talk about some of that uh, as we go along. Thanks. Hi. Uh, this is Manoj Agarwal. I'm from C Fund. We're an early stage tech fund. Uh, we started in 2018. Right now, we are in our second fund. And our first fund was more focused around technology. Here, we are talking about deeper technology. And AI certainly becomes today a core part of any technology investment. So yes, so we don't call us an AI fund, but AI will be an element in all our investments. I'm Kanika. I'm a partner with Vertex Ventures. We are a broad-based VC fund, and we invest in both India and Southeast Asia. Uh, we are a little different because uh, we do all sectors. So we invest in consumer, fintech, uh, software or SaaS, mobility, health, and so on. And the way we are thinking about AI is that it's not a separate segment. AI is something which will touch all the other sectors that we invest in. And therefore, what we're on the lookout for is uh, a more disruptive product, which is either more efficient or adds more value and incorporates AI in a very core manner. So that's how we're thinking about it. Uh, we typically do both uh, seed and uh, series A investments. So I think I would also say that we're still very much in the learning phase on what AI is today and also what AI can be in the future. Uh, so yeah, very happy to hear from all of you. Yeah, Kanika, maybe I'll just pose a question to you. Um, so obviously you're a broad tech fund. So within the AI space, what are your current views and how do you see the space spanning out? Uh, sure. So I think we did some work and we've broadly bucketed what AI means for a fund like us into three segments. Uh, so one is the very large foundational AI, which is already being built in the US, right? So your chat GPT, your stable diffusion, um, whatever the big tech is building. So that's a foundational um, model which will actually form the base of everything else to come. The second piece of AI is the application layer, which we see a lot more of in India, which actually builds off a fundamental or a foundational model. And then the third piece is all the enabling technology. So whether it's microchips, uh, it's the orchestration piece, it's the data labeling, uh, cyber security, AI ethics, etc. Right, so for a fund like us, I think it's going to be very difficult to invest now in a foundational model because that is fundamentally something which requires hundreds of millions of dollars. And uh, you know, while one or two startups have raised that amount of money, that's not um, reasonable to do so because people are far ahead. So for us, we are focusing more on the application layer. And then within application layer, we are finding a lot more today applications into software or SaaS. And then the second piece we're also trying to build or trying to think about is, you know, can there be innovation on the chip or can there be innovation on some of the other enabling elements, which actually India has done really well in the pre-generative AI era. So we already have a lot of talent and we're seeing some interesting things there. So I think application and enablement is what we'll focus on more versus, you know, core AI infra, which, um, you know, maybe a one-off, but not something which we'll see a lot of, at least from India. So thank you so much for giving a you know, brief introduction about you guys. And uh, you know, just we had a keynote prior to this about this entire GPT, you know, this craze going on. So I just want to know what is AI, uh, becoming an AI startup? Is this just a trend going on right now? Or is it here to stay for the long run? I'll go with you, sir. So I know. I think the euphoria is now settling. So with this whole chat GPT thing, there was this whole euphoria and people were really worried. You know, I remember in my community, there's a professor who is a computer science professor from a, a university of Illinois and he actually organized a session in the community on how to handle this, you know, for students because learning is getting impacted, everything's getting impacted. 
But what we see now is that the euphoria is settling down, reality is sinking in, and so AI is here to stay. And nothing new about AI. You know, it's been there. I did it as a theory subject when I studied computer science many, many years back. But today, you know, technology has come to a level where we are able to practically, you know, use it. I just, while I was thinking, and you know, um, gentleman before us was talking about uh, the whole use of AI, chat, GPT, large language models. So I remembered, uh, so as a kid, I am from Calcutta. I used to go with my mother shopping sometimes, say, say to a sari shop. And this gentleman there, he would read her mind and show a bunch of saris which he would understand will be in her budget to her liking and all that. And she would select probably one, two, three of them. So I mean, when it comes to e probably AI does that, right? You know, an element of AI kind of understands what we are looking at and gives us those options, right? So that has been happening now. And things like this will improve, like uh, the whole custom, custom the largest uh, element of AI is being used today in customer experience. The data he showed us was about 38% of usage is around customer experience. So similarly, healthcare and various other areas, the use of AI will grow more in applications. So, you know, a lot more has to come. Things will settle down and we will, you, we will uh, learn to adapt to it. Do you, sir? Yeah, no. so we started five ventures actually in 2017 and we were an AI only fund. And imagine seven years back, there was literally no talk of AI, even though AI was still, and then when we went and pitched to our investors, People, people just bawled at us and said, are you crazy? Right, and uh, so, so AI as a concept has been around, as uh, Manoj said, for, for, for a while. It's only over the last two to three years where the intelligence has become a lot more deeper. And that's also because of the compute, uh, the compute that is enabling a lot of the intelligence to happen in real time. Um, just like today we say, we don't say it's a cloud native company, right? 10 years back, cloud was a theme. Now every enterprise is a cloud native company. We feel in the next five to seven years, every enterprise, every startup will be an AI native startup. So, so AI is here to stay. Uh, in what shape or form, I think we've seen a lot of focus on digital AI, uh, but, but we at Pi, because we, we, we are a deep tech fund, we are an early stage deep tech fund, C, pre series A, series A. So we're always looking for something uh, that could be the next big thing. Um, and so we are really excited about this physical embodiment AI as well. Uh, so we've seen the digital AI where LLMs can do a bunch of things, but can you sort of really have humanoid robots running complex automated tasks for you, right? That's the embodiment AI that, that we're talking about. So there are a bunch of things that at Pi Ventures we're excited about from a deep tech team. And, and, and uh, yeah, so, so. Great, thank you, sir. Kanika, I'll have a different question for you. Since you mentioned you are primarily invest, uh, investing in the sea area, like Southeast Asia, yeah, uh, yeah, and India, yeah. So I just want to understand what is a different kind of, you know, like a trend or, you know, like a mindset between entrepreneurs then, entrepreneurs here who are working on, you know, AI solutions and AI startups. Sure. I think, um, you know, clearly US is the home of AI today, right? So I think a lot of the deep tech research has started in the US and therefore most of the founders in India and Southeast Asia uh, look to the US for inspiration and they also look to the US for ideas. So if you're a founder building in this region, you really need to understand what's already happened you know, what is the tech which has already been built and figure out a way to leverage that versus compete with something which has already been done. Um, I think the inherent advantage India has is that we now have a very, very deep talent base. You know, people who've been working at Google, people who've been working at Microsoft, uh, people who understand the different elements of technology, you know, whether it's AI or affiliated or really any part of uh, software technology. So we inherently have deep capabilities at a lower cost. And um, a lot of times what we try and see is that, you know, leveraging this advantage, can you actually beat someone in the US on lower cost, better tech? 
So I think that mindset is very interesting. And we're seeing a lot more founders kind of taking that bold step and say that, um, yes, you know, I can, I, I know how to build software. Uh, you know, I understand AI really well, and therefore I can build a product which is fundamentally better at lower cost. So I think that is where, uh, you know, India is. And I would say Southeast Asia is actually a little bit behind India. So a lot of Southeast Asia actually looks to India for inspiration. And therefore, uh, you know, the opportunity for uh, Indian founders is that if you're building, actually you have even Southeast Asia open to you as a market. And, um, you know, countries like Japan, South Korea, they're all um, looking to kind of understand technology and deploy it in their very traditional industries. So it's actually not a market to be ignored. And I would say at least in this piece, we are we actually have both these kind of opportunities open, which we can evaluate. Great, great. Thank you. Now, this question is to all three of you. You know, being investors in AI startups, what is the one, uh, you know, like a pro and one uh, one con kind of a thing you tell your, you know, startups, potential startups, you're going to, you know, invest in the AI startups. Um, so maybe I'll start with the con first. I think at least from our perspective, um, it's a fairly difficult space to diligence because we actually don't know what's going to happen in AI a year from now, right? Already, if you look at generative AI a year ago and we look at it now, if you just see the quality of articulation on chat or the quality of videos or the quality of photos coming out now, um, we actually don't know where the, the market is moving. And therefore, I think one of the cons is that if you're building something which is very superficial, you, you're going to get disrupted very quickly. And, you know, so even to your fat question, if you're just thinking, okay, this is really cool, let me build like a quick thing on top of it and, you know, people will love it. I think a lot of that we're very, very wary about because we feel that, you know, you have to have kind of very deep thinking about what is a business you can build 10 years from now in a fairly dynamic and uncertain technology environment. So I think that's the con. Uh, the pro is that we actually have, you know, people thinking out of the box. And um, we're also seeing that, you know, you don't have to build an AI startup. You can have a company where you're solving a real problem and actually AI is enabling it. And actually that kind of thesis we really like because you have a problem which can be solved from a commercial aspect and then AI is the plug you use to make your product 10 times better and more efficient. And that for us is as good as saying that, oh, I'm an AI company. So I think that's the, the very interesting piece, which is kind of here and now, which we're seeing. You. So when, when we look at an AI focused company today, I mean, we are very conscious of, you know, how it can be misused, right? You know? So one has to be very careful. You can have a very interesting tech, uh, especially multimodal AI, right? Audio, video, text. Now, some of this can be misused, right? With the whole development around deep fake, you know, we have seen enough cases, you know. I remember this interview with Bill Gates and many of these kind of situations. And it can actually create, uh, create trouble. There can be riots and stuff like that. So we are very conscious of that and we would like to avoid those kind of investments. But at the same time, something very similar. You know, today I looked at a company doing multimodal AI, but actually identifying the fake. You know, across across these categories of audio, video, and the use case could be to start with, you know, today we are all very familiar with uh, KYC, right? In, in the VFSI space, uh, video KYC. Imagine a KYC for opening an account being done with a fake person. So there's a lot of work happening around that. So how, how to identify whether it's a fake. So I think these are the ways we look at it, you know, the pro side and the con side. Shivami. Yeah. Mm. So we, we just, uh, just maybe laying out the landscape, we're looking at three major themes at our fund, right? One is AI tooling and infra. And, and I think Manoj and Kanika have reference. So we've invested in a company that does security for LLMs. We've invested in a company that does testing of AI models. So once AI models are deployed, are they drifting? Are they giving the wrong recommendations? We've, we've all 
heard reports of Tesla cars or autonomous driving cars crashing, right? That's because the AI models are able to identify objects in real time. And we've invested in a company that again does real time streaming machine learning. So this AI tooling infra piece is very, we, we feel that if, if every enterprise is going to adopt AI, the tooling and AI, uh, the tooling and infra that exists today is not sufficient to enable that. So that's one area. We are also excited about, and to Kanika's kind of point, we are also excited actually at our point about foundation models. Not the, not your traditional LMs, I think uh, photo, text, images, all sort of problems, but domain specific LLM problems, right? So Google has launched their genome version, that, that is a material science focused foundation model. You have Bloomberg GPT, which is a financial uh, foundation model. So we're looking at non-text, non-video foundation models. It could be in genomics, it could be a physics, chemistry, that's something that we are excited about. And the third part is, um, over the last three to five years, obviously NVIDIA is the, is the uh, global leader, but people have developed AI accelerator chips, uh, specifically designed for particular use cases, most probably for edge AI. So we are really excited about memory and compute optimization on the AI accelerator side. So now when, when looking at these three sort of areas, uh, and we, we, are, we are staying away a bit from the application side because we are a deep tech fund. Uh, but when looking at the three areas that we're focusing on, uh, our, our questions to founders is, what is your mode? Is it on the architecture side? Is it on the data side? Um, if it is on the architecture side, then, then we, we actually go in and actually understand the technical architecture. If it's on the data side, then is it, does, you, does, does the fact remain that an existing LLM can be fine tuned to give a similar sort of result? We're not interested in uh, is it. A, is it a feature or a product that you're launching? I think founders need to be able to sort of think about the fact that the Gen AI LLM space is going to rapidly move. So what appears cutting edge today will not be cutting edge 12 to 18 months down the line. So unless you're able to clearly articulate where your mode is going to be and whether you're building a product or a feature, I think that sort of helps us differentiate between potential investing company and, and the one that we're marketing. Great, and this will be my last question to all three of you, and then we'll open the stage for audience questioning. Uh, knowing the fact that how regulation is a big concern for the AI and the new you know, AI advisory, holistically speaking, why, when do you think and by when do you think AI can become, uh, India can become an AI superpower? I think the regulation they've already started, right? Uh, now the enterprise companies and startups need to go through the Indian government to for LLM adoption, right? Uh, so I think each, I think politically most countries will try and sort of at least influence that there are some internal foundation models built. Data security is going to be a challenge. I think all uh, all nations will insist that all data flowing through foundation models reside in local data centers. I think that is just a, that that is a given. Uh, from a regulation perspective, I think I think there is a there's a fine line. I think Europe. You see, Europe has over-regulated a bit for the last decade and or so, and then actually lost out on the this entire technological innovation wave. So, so I think India has to be careful in terms of what it regulates, what it doesn't. I think if you if you try and uh, yeah, cuff the hands of founders and enterprises, then a lot of the talent will actually uh, move out and start building. And we we've actually seen that a lot of the infra and tooling companies either move to Singapore or the US, where there's a lot. That is a better ecosystem to develop such things. So I think uh, we, we feel that with the given talent that India possesses, with the abundance of capital that is chasing these founders, uh, we feel that India could, the AI SaaS or AI infra layer, could be the next big driver or the next big export from the Indian tech community to the world. Maybe, maybe in the next three to five years, we should start seeing uh, some sign of it. We, we have a portfolio company called Pixis that we that does generative AI for the marketing stack. We invested in them in 2019 before generative AI was even possible. We didn't know what it was going to be. Then now it's over 250 million. Right? So, so I, think, I think it's very difficult to sort of predict the timeline, but in the next three to five years, we should start seeing offshoots for, for some of the work that's already happening. Thank you, Kanika. Yeah. You know, I think it's a $100 billion question. Um, I think the regulation 
is just starting because frankly the technology is just starting to get built out so i think in every ecosystem there's push and pull so the fact that regulation is starting to come in is actually a positive sign it means that there is enough activity now in the ecosystem that the government needs to think about it and i think if you look at all the other sectors in the you know whether it's it services or whether it's automotive or whether it's energy uh, the government has largely been an enabler and will likely continue to you know do that as well for this segment uh, so i think we have the people you know we have the capability we also have uh, a lot of deep domestic capital waiting to be invested uh, so really it's a matter of you know who is that first cohort of founders who take the big bets and uh, build disruptive ai and uh, i think it's a matter of time so whether it's 5 years or 7 years it's difficult to say um, but really i think the constraints are getting removed so the uh, playing field is becoming a lot more interesting for anyone who wants to dive in right now okay thank you sir so i mean today there was an announcement by the minister for 10000 to invest in infra invest in technologies which is a positive sign so that means the government is recognizing ai as an important development so there needs to be regulation but not over regulation so i think we are on that path and you know time will i i see i id services like kanika mentioned was so there was not much need to regulate right it was providing services to you know it was more to do with uh, automating at the very basic level but this is something which will impact people people daily lives of people how they use ai embedded in various day to day functioning of people will become important so the use and misuse is very critical so i see it more like telecom the telecom revolution which certainly transformed all our lives you know and i see that happening with ai where it will get embedded it may not be as visible as telecom like you know phone in your hand it will be inside the phone inside the device inside the activities we do you know and so it, it is important to regulate it but regulate it right so yeah a lot lot has to happen we are at the very beginning of this cycle and next few and this will move very fast you know much faster than like telecom in india was very fast <laughs> compared to the rest of the world but this will move even faster and this fortunately for us we are not cut off from the rest like we have not started late I and mean, we have started at similar times as probably any any other part of the world great thank you sir now we open it to the audience just two questions Yeah, there was a comment that we have to see whether it's a feature or a product in the AI. So can you elaborate more how to distinguish? Because every product becomes an ultimate feature in the past. We have seen that. So what exactly do you mean? If you are referring to how whether it's a product or feature, for most probably it is a feature. So what I what I mean to say here is that if if anything can be done with easy fine tuning of local data, if something can be built by two devs. on top of an open source ai model it probably is a feature uh, so so you have to be very careful in, in where do you invest a lot of the time in building the product and then building a product requires going deeper than building a feature so i think i think you have to imagine how an enterprise workflow will look like and if and then you have to build it out from the top down if you are if you are leveraging an open source ai adding a couple of Fine tuned variations on top. I think there are about on hugging face about half a million AI models that exist. So pretty much you will have a repository of AI models that will exist for a particular use case. Now, if you are, if you are, I would, I would say, if you are able to build an autonomous AI agent uh, that can that can be generalized, uh, then that's not a feature. Right? So, so I think maybe maybe we can take this offline, but but we need to think about it uh, in in very sort of complex terms and how. This uh, particular sort of product will evolve, and whether this will end up being a point in time feature. 
Right, I have another question. Uh, so, so yeah. uh, my name is Ratan. I'm the founder of an early stage HR tech uh, organization startup called Tableau. My question is for you, Sudeep. So right at the beginning, you mentioned uh, humanoids could also possibly govern. Right now, we're at the Gen AI stage, and so what's going to be next after this? So because I come from an HR background predominantly, I can define or I can categorize jobs into three or four different types. Right? One is obviously mechanical jobs. Then there are cognitive jobs and then there are creative jobs. It looks like Gen AI has gone the way of tackling the creative jobs first, and that's why you see videos where they are today, you see you know, images where they are today, perhaps cognitive is next. And so the question I have for you is just on the functional jobs, do we see as much of a disruption with humanoids and all of this coming in on this as it perhaps has been for the creative side? Just curious to know because that would perhaps create a lot more problems that we are probably equipped to handle these days. Which is Curious to your thoughts on it, given uh, this is something you mentioned right before. Yeah, um, actually, humanoid robots are coming faster than we think that they're coming, right? Uh, just to give you uh, uh, robotic automation has been around for the better part of the last decade, right? We have seen warehouse automation, we've seen automotive automation. Uh, over the last 12 months, we've had companies such as Tesla Optimus Prime, uh, but Figure AI, where they've built. Uh, where they built full autonomous navigation stacks that we see in autonomous vehicles. But now they've uh, layered Gen AI and language understanding on top of that. So the so robot can actually understand your input and then it can autonomously navigate. Now obviously the currently the functional humanoid robots can only do a series of tasks. Like unlike a human which learns in real time and then a human if you teach them to pick up a table, they learn to pick up 50 other things. Where the humanoid robot currently can then sort of just pick up a table or similar sort of uh, geographical sort of items. So I think, but with the learning curve of humanoid robots that we see, and we've looked at a couple of companies, I think, I think, in, in, at least in the uh, manufacturing, warehouse, a lot of the blue collar jobs, currently the Gen AI is going for white collar jobs. But uh, humanoid robots coming for blue collar jobs is not very far away, I would say maybe about five years uh, in, in some of these global markets where even the shop. So, what you want to say? Okay. Thank you so much, Manika. Thank you, sir. Thank you.